Hi, it's Rebecca Whitman, your host of the Balanced, Beautiful, and Abundant Show. I'm a top-rated life coach, an international best-selling author, and a multi-passionate entrepreneur. I'm on a mission to help you go from burned out to balanced, beautiful, and abundant. The experts on this show will help you achieve work-life balance so that you can experience abundance in seven pillars of life, spirituality, health, emotions, romance, mindset, social, and financial life. When you have all seven pillars of life in alignment, you are balanced, beautiful, and abundant. Let's go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Balance, Beautiful, and Abundant show. I am your host, Rebecca Whitman, and we are going to take you from burned out to balanced, beautiful, and abundant. And I want to thank all my listeners who were so generous to share this podcast with a friend. We got our ratings. We are in the top 1% globally in self-help. And it is because of you guys sharing the message with your friends that you don't have to be burned out and overwhelmed. You can go through life with balance, beauty, and abundance. So today we have a great guest. Welcome to the show, Dr. Fujan. Hi, it's so nice to be with you and with everyone who is with us on all the social media. Yes, we are on Facebook, Instagram, and of course, all major podcast platforms. And I had the great pleasure of being on Dr. Fujan's podcast a couple months ago, and we had such a great time and such a connected conversation that we wanted to keep it going on the Balanced, Beautiful, and Abundant show. So let me tell my guests a little bit or my listeners about my guest, my wonderful guest, Dr. Fujan. She is a psychotherapist, a podcast host, a speaker, and an author with a doctorate in clinical psychology. She is also a licensed marriage and family therapist. She is the originator of the awareness integration method, which is an educational and psychological theory. She is the author of six books and the host of A Heartfelt Chat, a wonderful podcast that I highly recommend checking out with Dr. Fujian. She has appeared on the Dr. Phil Show and has spoken at great universities such as MIT, UCLA, UCSB, and Harvard. She has her very own app called Fujian, giving people an opportunity to experience self-awareness and life fulfillment. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's a, it's a joy. We had a great conversation on my podcast, uh, a heartfelt chat with Dr. Fujan, and we're going to continue here. Yes, we're going to continue it here. So tell us your story, Dr. Fujan. How did you get to be someone who is a famous psychotherapist with their own app and their own method? Tell us a little bit about how you started. Of course. Um, you know, I immigrated when I was 12 on my own, kind of, um, to um, to U.S. from Iran and kind of raised myself. But then, you know, I had a lot of traumas in the past. I've had, you know, my parents got divorced. I had like sexual abuse. They, you know, the immigration alone on its own. Um, coming to a different place in teenage years, it was just traumatic in itself. And I was like, you know, I promised myself that I was going to make it. And, you know, by age 30, I was going to be, um, you know, I was going to have my own business. I was going to be married and I was going to own a house. And, you know, by 28, I did it all. And then I was not happy. You know, I was, I had my business. I had like my flower business. Um, I was burnt out already because I was getting up like three o'clock in the morning, go, go and get the flower, all of those. So, you know, I got to, I got everything I said I wanted and even earlier than that, but it wasn't satisfying. I was not happy. And I was completely like burned out of life already and not knowing where else to go. Like, okay. I, you know, you have a vision, you get there and you're like, oh, this isn't the vision. This isn't what I wanted. That's weird. Now what do I want? I don't know. So I started going to therapy and uh, a lot of self-progress um, kind of coaching seminars, you know? 
And I started working on myself and um, I enjoyed what it had done for me and what it had done for, you know, my other peers. And I thought, this is what I want to do. That's my calling. So I went back to school and started learning every single theory that was there from, you know, cognitive theories that worked on your thoughts and shifting your thoughts, emotional ones, you know, body and mind, mindfulness, hypnosis, trauma-based. And, you know, how every time I learned something in the coaching world also, every time I learned something, I brought it and worked it with my clients. And, you know, then it was like it created a version of all of these with me in it. And I'm like, oh, this works very well. So I started, you know, I had a huge um, a clinic with almost 60 therapists uh, from across the world, multilingual, multicultural um, clinic and um so i started teaching the therapists who were working with me and we started doing a lot of research where you know i took from the best of the best was uh, i was out there and then brought it together and created almost like a module that takes every piece of them and brings it together in a, a new format which was which became very very efficient very quickly uh, so we started doing research uh, with different demographics and we found that it you know reduces depression and anxiety up to like 76 percent and then raises your self-esteem self-confidence self-agency and um, so on a clinical world this was taking off and then we started working uh, with the students because of research and i'm now teaching it at cal state long beach and we're attempting to you know go to different colleges and have you know students which around that age have the highest level of anxiety and depression and they're just building you know who they are and their identity so bringing this to kind of like core classes of college classes we you know, we started working with um young uh, uh you know, from infant to six years of age in daycare and we're seeing astonishing results of you know emotional regulation even as that early as age and allows them to really learn uh, faster and becoming school ready faster um, and I'm teaching therapists and coaches across the world and then because we did the um, the, the research in Cal State Long Beach without any clinical work and you know the book um, Life Reset we figured okay well for the group of people who like to do as a, as a self-help let's do the app so so far we've had the app um promoted for since January so it's about 10 months and even with the app we're seeing like 60 percent improvement in the areas that they're working there's 31 areas of life that they can work on wow let so, me back up so you're referring to the awareness integration method that's what you tested yes uh, okay yeah and then we have our institute going global so we have Canada Dubai Iran and you know, Australia and different places in Europe uh, kind of being trained and is beginning to create the institute and really teaching the therapist and going into colleges. So we're excited. That's exciting. What is the institute called? Uh, the International Awareness Integration Institute. I love it. So uh, we talk a lot about self-care on this podcast because that's a huge facet in preventing burnout. So what advice do you have to your patients about burnout, recovery from burnout, cultivating self-care? What, what advice can you give us? Rebecca, one of the most important factors that we have as a human being is to become aware of ourselves. We're not trained in that. So, uh, you know, we do now mindfulness is taking on and we can kind of like look at ourselves. Mindfulness, it's wonderful but sometimes it's just training us to be passively looking at ourselves so what we're doing in the um, AIT awareness integration theory is so taking the mindfulness concept of awareness but also becoming active of becoming aware of your thought process your emotional process your body how it's you know how your emotions and needs are in your body and you could listen to them and how do you behave and you know then looking at becoming responsible about the impact of our attitude you know thoughts emotions and behaviors in our life so burnout happens and i've gone through that many times myself and coming out it's when you're not noticing your body mm. when you're so focused out there on your goals 
that you forget that this vehicle is the one that's got to be functional before you could do any of those. Like there were times oh my God, that I would just sit there and I was so tired that I would just cry because that's the only way that I could release. It was just, that, that's it. Like I would just cry. And then at one point it's like, well, what am I doing to myself? Although this goal that I have envisioned for me is important but I'm not taking care of this in order to get that. And usually if I don't, this one will collapse and whatever's out there that I'm working on is going to collapse. So when looking at first going into when your body is giving you a signal, like it could be tired, you could have a lot of like intense emotions at that time that you're kind of like shoving it aside and you're not listening because emotions are signals. They're just telling you, knock, knock, take care of me. This is my message. If I'm ignoring it and just shoving it and not listening to it, then it, uh, it stores in the body in a way that creates more stress. And then what do we do? We eat unhealthy because at the time of stress, I'm going to eat, I I'm going to need sugar in order to create more energy for myself, right? So our nutrition goes down. I won't be able to sleep because I have so much on my mind and my body's so stressed and I ate so much sugar that my eight hours sleep that my body needs to get rested and absolutely in that deep rest to be able to rejuvenate itself is not there. So you can see that it's like a domino effect that it just takes this vehicle and crashes it. So what do we do first? Listen to your body. If you have aches, if you have, you know, emotions that are sharing with you, um, then we come back and try to balance the calendar. Because whenever I talk about balance, people think I'm, you know, saying a dirty word is like, it's never going to happen. Well, it remain remaining, putting yourself in a position that you at always expecting yourself to be in a balance doesn't happen. But balance is like a seesaw, right? Like you don't right. stay here. You go like this, then you bring yourself to the balance and you go like this. So it's a, that way of awareness of where am I and how can I bring myself? One of the easiest way to do that is a structurally balance your calendar first, right? Yes. So, right? So you put your eight hours of sleep, like it's non-negotiable. There are things that are non-negotiable. Eight hours of sleep is non-negotiable, right? Then put your exercise because if you don't exercise you're not going to get energy exercise any way you like you know mm -hmm. you walk you could do uh, pelotons you could do you know gym you could do cardio you could you know jump up and down whatever you want you can do yoga but put your exercise because that's your energy put your food because that's your energy you know put those times where you could actually prepare food for yourself and eat food uh, on your own, not like, you know, looking at things. <laughs> I mean, yeah, exactly. Right. So first it's like, can you take care of this vehicle? It's almost like, you know, if you're going to go somewhere with your car, guess what? The car needs to have your, you know, four wheels balanced. You have to have, you know, either electricity or gas in it. You, it has to work, right? If you're, if you're working like you and I right now through the computer, the computer has to work. The electricity has to work before you and I can do this. So if right. you can imagine that, can you imagine that this body needs to work before you could do anything and get anything done? So in your calendar, you first do this. You first take care of your body in that way. If you need to put meditation, if you need to put reflection time, which is very, you know, important. So you're not in this rat race constantly, you know, going, going, but you also have a reflection time. So maybe you can put a half an hour in the morning, 15 minutes of what do I intend to happen today? Look at my today, right? And whatever is happening in the calendar today, how can I be intentional on everything I do? I have a meeting, I have a, you know, podcast with Rebecca, what's my intention? What do I want to create with Rebecca? What do I want to create with all of the Rebecca's audience who are taking their time and, you know, honoring us to be with us? What is it that I intend to, to be there? And then throughout the day, you create that intention for yourself. And then somehow, you know, maybe as you're brushing your teeth or whatever it is, you create a time for you to reflect. How did I do this all day today? Who was I? How did I create the intentions that I wanted? Did I actualize them? 
what worked for me? What were everything that I could say? You did it. <laughs> what made me do that? Like, what was it about me that created that result? And what were the parts that didn't work out? You know, what did I learn from it? Which part do I needed to change and shift if I wanted to create that? So those are very, very helpful tips to use. Mm, those are great visual structures in order to get uh, to, to create that balance first. I love that. I am a huge believer in being a student of our calendar because people can be so overwhelmed by time. But if you really understand how time works, you're in control of time. Time is manufactured. It's not real. It's just something that humans use to organize themselves. And having control over your calendar and studying it to maximize your time I know for me, it's such a huge game changer. So I, I really love that advice. And of course, planning your day around your bare necessities to function as a body, your food, your sleep, and your exercise. I, I know uh, someone that is very famous in the business world died at age 34 of colon cancer. And she was a huge hero of mine. Her name is Jessie Lee. She's been on this podcast. She was... Uh, making a million dollars a month in the network marketing space, a million dollars a month, but she didn't take care of her body. So now she's gone. She just died last month. She's not even on the planet. So what good is a million dollars a month if you're not even alive? Because at age 34, she literally worked her body into the ground. It's, I mean, burnout, people don't take it seriously. It is a life-threatening illness as you could see from that example. So thank you so much for those great tips. Also, uh, not, go ahead. To add to what you said is yeah. not only our body, but also we do all of these things to, you know, go forward, set the goals and, and wanting to be active in order to supposedly be happy, supposedly be fulfilled. Yes. Right. If your body and your psyche is not there, if you're not enjoying kind of every minute of what you're doing, this is all going to waste because like yes. you said, you can make million dollars, but you're not, you know, if you're always frazzled and anxious and, you know, you're, uh, you're looking at the next thing and you're not actually enjoying every minute of what you're doing, then what are you doing it for? Oh, that's so true. Yeah. Burnout isn't just burning out your body physically. It's your stress and your mindset. If you are achieving your goals and not having fun and enjoying the journey, then what's the point? If you're not enjoying your life, life is short. We want to have, you know, joy and freedom while we're here. So then it's, it's time to really reevaluate what you're doing with your life. If you're doing, 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 like people are so caught up in the doing this. They think they're human doings and not human beings. And they really... They lose the joy of life. I think that's part of Western culture is we're so goal oriented and it's like, I will be happy when I get over there. I call it over there as like when I graduate college, when I get my master's, when I get my doctorate, when I get married, when I have kids, when my kids go to college, when my kids have grandkids. And then we look back on our life and we realize we were never happy because we kept putting our happiness over there. and. You never get over there when you do that. You're like the donkey chasing the carrot. Very much. Yes. yes. So my next question, you are involved in uh, the recovery movement, recovery from addiction, right? That is so wonderful. That's a movement near and dear to my heart because I have 20 years of sobriety one day at a time. And I love, I'm in several 12-step groups. It's such an incredible movement. How did you go from getting your doctorate in clinical psychology to being such a big part of the recovery movement? My father was an alcoholic, was a very functional alcoholic, and he died at age 58. His liver just wasn't working anymore. Mm. Um, two of my brothers uh, were also addicted to uh, poly substances. And I'm, I'm an addict. I started, you know, let's, let's put it this way. I started sucking my thumb when I was very early on and then all the way to teenager, listen, this, this thing was not come. I was so attached. 
<laughs> and you know, by teenagers, it was like, okay, this doesn't work. It's just not cool, not cool anymore, right? So I, I I changed it to cigarettes, right? So started smoking around like 12, 13, all the way like 35, 40. Okay, no longer works for me to use cigarettes. So then I changed it to food, right? So it's the addictive mind and the my brain is, is an addict. I recognize my attachment and the an inability of, you know, uh, that although I knew all of the information, it was irrelevant to that other part of me who was going to do whatever it needed to do in order to lie to me and just have pleasure the way it intended to have pleasure, which wasn't a pleasure in the bigger picture of my life. It was just one side of pleasure. So working on myself, becoming aware of myself and looking at that, and then obviously having the family system and working in the field of psychotherapy, it's kind of hard not to run in to, you know, of uh, the concept of an addiction. So I started studying addiction and I started working with uh, different um, people who had addictions. And then I worked um, at different hospitals and rehab centers. And then finally I opened my own um um, outpatient program for addiction and addiction has changed you know a kind of face and the, and the way it has for the past 30 years um, but the dynamic is similar the drugs are different the impact of the drugs and the behaviors are different um, you know we now have a video game which we didn't have then and mm. you know we have fentanyl which we didn't have then so there's the dynamic uh, the dynamic is the same only the external pieces have changed and therefore consequences have changed. And then we have to deal with the new consequences and all of that. Um, but that's where it's so dear to me. And I think it's uh, it's an illness that we need to treat it as an illness. We need to honor it. We need to take the shame out of it and really look at it as, um, as, as an illness that um, unfortunately it takes the organ that is a decision maker. Like if I, um, you know, if I was diagnosed with cancer, my brain could make appropriate decisions for me in order for my treatment to move forward. But because the disease of addiction, the illness of addiction is a mind um, and a brain, uh, you know, illness, the brain doesn't make the right decisions for me. So I need to be able to understand it, learn it, uh, manage it and um, and live with it. It's like, you know, if I had diabetes, I would have to manage it for the rest of my life. And someone who uh, recognizes and they see that they've, you know, passed that invisible line to the addiction, now they have to manage that for the rest of their life. And uh, that's another self-care. Like instead of being in denial, instead of pushing it aside, instead of having shame around it, let me understand this and let me take care of myself because um, someone who's an addict who's an addict is not just suffering on their own they become the cause of also suffering for everybody else around them everyone who's around an addict uh they suffer you know mm -hmm. from their children to their mate to their society to work and everyone so if i can be responsible for me it's it's a domino effect that I my responsibility about me has actually you know created a whole different system around me too. So if there's anybody out there who's listening to us and they're you know kind of like suffering around addiction, this is a treatable and manageable illness. Yes. And AA, NA, Al-Anon, uh, Narcanon are amazing support groups. The 12 steps are amazing. amazing. It might not be enough for everyone. It could be enough for some group. If it's not enough for someone, they need to really, you know, get more clinical work. And uh, underneath addiction is anxiety. Underneath it is trauma. Yes. And it is the you know this kind of like dissociation from the self it's like you split and two parts of you are fighting with each other and sometimes you need more support and that's where like the clinical you know psychotherapy with people who are you know trained in in um addiction helps it could be that what maybe beforehand because you had trauma anxiety and depression there was some chemical change that you started 
um, self-medicating, you know, with, with drugs and uh, alcohol, instead of, you know, going and being medicated in a medical management treatment where you, where you could actually be treated for the purpose of any of those versus you, you know, trying to self-medicate yourself and get yourself into more trouble. And therefore maybe, you know, a psychiatrist or a medical management could be a part of this team. So that's also an amazing, because Rebecca, the other part is that people get burned out and they just go to alcohol or they go to marijuana. And it's as if like, okay, instead of going to a, you know, take a bath and meditate and, you know, do yoga and take care of yourself, it's faster, you know, one glass of wine. Or they go to cigarettes. Or cigarettes on all right? of them, faster. So sometimes in order, instead of facing our burnout and taking care of ourselves, we numb it. It doesn't take care of the burnout. You just added toxins to your body. That's all you did. You never learned anything else in what to do. And therefore you kind of, could have, you're going to go into a destructive mode. Well, people do not want to feel uncomfortable feelings. And I think the reason why addiction is so widespread, I mean, you could say that your iPhone is an addiction or online shopping or anything. People are just not willing to slow down and feel uncomfortable feelings and they're just numbing out. And that brings me to another question. One of the great things about working the 12 steps is you get to look at your patterns and kind of see, like you said, a lot of addiction is connected to unprocessed trauma and look at your past. And once you feel those feelings and see the patterns and you can let it go and create a whole new reality, what advice do you have about completing with your past? Your past is coming with you. It's part, it becomes part of your subconscious. Your past means that you and I made some decisions about ourselves and the world. Something happened, you know, mm -hmm. in front of us. And uh, every one of us, if you and I were in exactly in the same position, when they did um, research on twins, you know, in the same family, in the same arena, all of that, you see that human being create perceptions out of whatever is happening. Something happens and we make meaning out of it. And each person makes their own kind of meaning and, and a perception. At that moment, when something happens, which is too much, it's overwhelming for our system, we make some meaning about ourselves or the world. So either I'm good, the world is good, I'm bad, the world is bad, I'm good, the world is bad. So we kind of make these, you know, generalized statements because we want to, you know, our system wants to automatize it so we could, you know, kind of like survive. We make statements of formulas, all of that in our in our head and hold on. But remember, if I made something around when I was two or five or 10, it and it's still running me on my programming, um, it, it doesn't serve me anymore. But if I'm not aware of what kind of belief systems are running me, um, I'm just going to go and continue and create the same results over and over again. I'm sure, you know, some of the people who are listening or being with us, they get it that, you know, I keep going into the wrong relationships because I have certain things and I duplicate it, or I go into work after work after work. And in each one of them, I do the same patterns and I'm creating the same results. I don't say it that I'm creating this. It's like, you know, all work is like this. All men are like that. All women. I mean, this is how we look at it. So going back and looking at if I'm creating something, what kind of a thought process, emotional and behaviors I'm doing, and what are my belief systems? Where did I get these things from? So we have, you know, AIT has six phases. And one of the phases is says, you know, how do I think of myself? What kind of, you know, belief systems have I created around me? Because what has six phases? Are you talking about your awareness and integration? Yes. yes. Okay. So the phase, you know, the phase one are my relationship to the world and how I think, feel, behave toward the world and the impact. Okay. Phase two is how do I assume other people are with me and how how do they think and feel about me? How are they behaving toward? Because we you know we live on our assumptions consistently and we react based on our assumptions. Phase three is who am I? You know my identity. What do I think about myself? What do I do to myself? You know, am I punishing myself? Am I, 
I'm curious about myself. Do I nurture myself? How do I feel? Am I, do I feel shame or do I feel proud? Like all the things that I have around my own identity. And based on this phase, we kind of then look at, oh, where did I come up with all of these things? And then we have a system of going to the past and kind of looking at the memory um, that created this belief system. You know, we go in, it's a, usually it was, you know, a, an issue that happened that I might felt small, might felt powerless, hopeless, and I didn't have, I was vulnerable. So in that vulnerability, I made some decisions about myself and the world. And then kind of bridging and bringing who we are with the bigger perspective, the bigger picture, and then we survive that, right? Like I'm here at, right. you know, I'm 62, I'm here at age 62, watching myself at five and like girl let me tell you we've not only survived that but we've survived <laughs> so much more these are the skills we already got and don't worry about it so we go back and look at the areas of our life and what did i make make up which is still carrying with me and then integrating it with the rest of me you know like some people uh, learn skills of communication when they go to work because that's where they learned how to communicate efficiently at work. But then they walk back home and they become a little girl or a little boy talking to their mother and father, like lost all, all skills and lost all of their power suddenly. So you get it how split we could be, right? A part right. of it always stays that. Another part is like efficient and moves forward. Well, can we get these two parts together? I mean, bring the skills all over the place. So that's why it's important for us to go back and clean up. Because the more you clean up and the more you get integrated, you have access to all parts of your brain, access to all of your skills, so yes, your vulnerabilities are here, but so are your strengths. And I was listening to actually a, a lecture today at one of the Harvard Extension Schools. Um, and it was more like, what is resiliency? And what's the difference between someone at the same location where they're resilient and the other one goes into really like breaks under trauma? And when they've done this research, they found out that the people who break under the trauma is because they made that a personal construct. Mm. Like, I'm a failure. I can't do it. I'm powerless. I'm good, no, no good for nothing. And the people who kept their resiliency was because they didn't attach the negativity to their identity. And they just saw it as an, is an issue that is out there that I need as a, as a capable person, human being, I got to figure out how to handle this problem and create a solution. So they looked at it from the, another place. So they held, they stayed in their strength while they looked at the problem versus the problem became who they are. So yes. what you're trying to do is to take off these labels that are not fair to you, off of you, and have you access to your strength while you look at life as a journey to go, you know, play. You make a mistake, you may fall, you may get up, you may win. And it's just all of it as a part of the journey. That reminds me of my favorite agreement from my favorite self-help book of all time, The Four Agreements, not to take anything personally. And that has been a lifelong challenge for me because it's so easy when somebody acts the way you don't want them to act or rejects you or you fail at something that's important to you. It's so easy to make an interpretation that it's me, I'm not good enough, or I'm not lovable or I'm inadequate. And how do you help people to reframe and reinterpret events when life inevitably is going to throw you challenges and rejections and failures and feeling left out? How do you help your patients reframe and reinterpret those events so they don't take them personally? First, I make them be aware of not generalizing it at least. Mm -hmm. Right. So I failed at this task. That's different than saying I'm a failure because I'm a failure means yes. you just generalize that to who you are as an identity everywhere, always, all. So we do like the reality check, which is 
well, you know, have you always failed? No. What, give me some of your successes. These. Have you ever tried different things? Yes. So they get that it's not that they're incapable or no good for nothing. They're, you know, they're it's different instances. They've had the skill. The other side of it is that do they know anyone who never makes a mistake? Do they know anyone? You know what I'm saying? Like what we do is usually compare our inadequacy and things that we made a mistake or failed at with everybody else's success now, yes. that's not a fair ground that's not apples to apples right? yeah. <laughs> we see people's success and you're like see they must have gotten there like effortlessly i don't know anyone who's gotten anywhere effortlessly right so yeah. what we do is we minimize our best and maximize our worst so it's like having that balance of they're both there. Look at the bigger picture. So I help them look at the bigger picture of who they are consistently. And then you, you, because you're looking at a bigger picture, you be willing to take off the, uh, the identity that you've assigned to yourself, because that's not true. Because the way you say, I am a loser, I would expect that every, every angle of your life that I lo that I look, you've lost. There's no way that that happens. So we look at the wins that are there. And so, you know, if you do the reality check, if I'm going to take the sticker off, but I lost here. Yes, you lost here. And that's all it is. You lost on one game. Good. What can we learn from it and move forward? You know, that's a different way of being with whatever is happening versus attaching it. So that's the first thing, how not to attach it uh, personally. But even if you are attaching it personally, not to make it a general statement about your identity. It's a personal. I love that. So, so and so rejected me. I'm no good. I'm not, I'm, I'm a person who's ugly and nobody. No, one person thought you were not their type. And that's it. Now, how many people have come to you and you thought they're not my type? Good. That's all. Do you think that anybody on their face of the earth that you said, oh, they're not my type, it makes them loser? Well, no, I just didn't like them. Yes, flip. That's all it was, one time. Have you had anybody ever come to you and say they're excited about you? Like, you know, go, yes, but I didn't like them. Bingo, that's what it is. So you do these kind of like reality check to strip away this generalization that is not accurate. It's just not accurate. It's falsified. People, if you're listening to this, be very careful. What I'm hearing Dr. Fujan say is not to label yourself because whatever you say after I am becomes your reality. Even if you're just joking around and you say, oh, I'm such a loser. I go on all these internet dates and nobody likes me and you're joking about it. The universe doesn't hear it as a joke and your subconscious hears it and just be very precise with the words that you say to yourself, especially after I am. Especially, now, I, I love what you said and I want to add to it. Yeah. Not, not, it doesn't necessarily mean that the world will give you that, but it means that no matter what the world will give you, you yes. see yourself as that. Yes, in a, you know, in a in in an abundant world. But if you think I'm not good enough, you won't yes. even see the opportunities that are there for you. Yeah, because you're looking at life through an, a a filter or a frame or paradigm of I'm never going to be enough. I'm never going to find the success. I'm I'm unlucky. And then when an opportunity knocks on your door. You won't even, you're right. You won't even realize it's there because that's literally the definition of being in your own way. Yes. And I imagine, you know, the world has, is here, whether you're here or not, the world is here with all of its opportunities. It just is. Now imagine you said to yourself, I'm never going to have McDonald's. Never, 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 never. And as you drive through a street, you're not going to see McDonald's. Because you already said, I'm never going to have McDonald's. It's not that McDonald's changed all of their locations because you said so. You just don't see it anymore. Mm -hmm. Right? So the point is that when, the, like you beautifully said, 
if you say these things to yourself, your world, your filters, your you know vision becomes limited to what you say. And you only see then what you say out of all the possibilities that are there in the world already. And the opposite is true too. If you say, if you're ever going to buy something, like if you're in the market for like a red car and you're like, oh, I don't know, is a red car really me? I'm going to look at the type of people that are driving red cars on the street. And you're like, oh my God, there's red cars everywhere. And all you see are red cars. Yes. So what you focus on, you get more of. Yes. Right. So choose what you focus on very carefully. So I know the people listening to this are going to want to check out your amazing app. How does your app work? Can anybody understand it? Even if they haven't studied your awareness integration method, is there a tutorial? What are the benefits of jumping on your app? Tell us all about it. Thank you. Yes, the app is on all the Apple stores and um, uh, you can get from Google Play if you have Android. So uh, both versions are out there. Um, it You have 31 areas of life to choose from. So as you go, yes, there's a video with a tutorial on what you can expect, but every single phase, there's an explanation. I personally explain it. This is what you're going to be going through. And then there's questions and processes that, you know, there's a question and then gives you examples, kind of like, you know, this could be an example of a thought process or an emotions and all of that. So you could, you know, go ahead and kind of journal in it and, and you, you could keep all the journals and, you know, the system does it for you and you can have it. And you go through the process, uh, there's, you know, uh, mindfulness techniques, there's uh, exercises as you go through, and it takes you through, like, for example, you could choose work. And I'll take you through the whole process of the six phases, just through work, right? And then when you're done, you can go through another one, um, self, body, you know, intimate relationship, sexuality, thought, nature, siblings, parents, every area of your life, um, you could just pick and choose and go over the whole process in the process also in around phase five where we're doing goal settings we kind of start looking at you know I want this goal but I really don't have that skill mm -hmm. I want to be more intimate with my partner but I don't have any skills in communicating I don't know how to communicate with my partner I want this and this with my with my child and I have no clue I've never had a child that's 11 years old at this point so I have no clue so then as you get that and you need some skills, then it takes you also to a library of videos of experts who can talk uh, about, you know, different skills where you can actually learn skill sets. Also that people go through like the phase four, which is going through the past traumas and, you know, all the unfinished businesses and we bring them up for you. If there's someone who needs more assistance, more help with someone, we have all of the, you know, certified coaches and certified uh, psychotherapists that it can be also accessed um, and, you know, you can make an appointment with them and uh, get to see them. So, but as you work on yourself, as it deepens and you need, you know, another buddy with you <laughs> in order to work with you, because uh, it's easier sometimes to work through the trauma with another human being, then they are also there for you. So, you can have access to all of them. Um, again, you can go to Apple or uh, Google Play. You could go to fujon.com, which is the, um, the uh, official uh, website for the app so that they can you know, uh, download it even from there and get more information about it. That's incredible. So you actually have therapists on call that are trained in the awareness integration method that can help people if, if you get stuck in one of the six phases, they can kind of help you break through it. How many therapists are connected to the app and trained in this wonderful method that you invented? We're uh, training hundreds and hundreds across the globe because uh, you know the app right now is in English and our um, project for next year is, is to also develop it in other languages. Uh, so right now it's written in English and the audio is in English, but as we're, you know, we're shifting it to other languages, we're training um, a lot at this point across the world to be there. So there are coaches which work more with your goal setting, there are psychotherapists who work with all of it and goal setting and, you know, going back. So there's hundreds and hundreds of coaches and therapists who you can have access to. 
So you're creating a movement. For, for life fulfillment, Rebecca. We all deserve Beautiful. to be fulfilled in our life. And like you said at the beginning, if we just stop getting on our own way, the system is set up and designed for fulfilling life. The system is designed for that. Sometimes we just, you know, kind of get in each other's way and our own way. So if we learn, you know, just to clean this up, uh, it's like, you know, like a, a diamond in the rough that comes in and then, you know, there's a lot of dirt around it. And the more you clean it up and, you know, kind of like have this, then, you know, as the light comes, it just shines, it shines in so many ways. So this is for, for you know, my, my goal is 8 billion people on the face of the earth have access to this so they can use it and be fulfilled in life. You can, if, if you have a phone, you can get this wonderful app and the app is called Fujan, F-O-O-J-A-N. So check it out. And how can we stay in touch with you, Dr. Fujan? Uh, my own website, fujanzain.com, um, F-O-J-A-N-Z-E-I-N-E.com. I am accessible, uh, you know, all my social media, Dr. Fujan Zain. So I love to connect with people um, and, and hear from them. What is it that they're needing? And we could create, you know, the, the model for them. We, you know, we're taking it to educational, to hopefully to high schools um, and junior high and all the colleges and, you know, taking it, you know, not just like a, a live your life, hit a wall, come back and we clean it, but also like learn going to the school system where it becomes part of the school system as people learn how to create fulfilling lives for themselves every day. Amazing. Well, you heard it here on the Balanced, Beautiful, and Abundant show. And Dr. Fujan's app will help you get fulfillment. And this wonderful podcast is helping you go from burned out and overwhelmed to balanced, beautiful, and abundant. So if you could take 30 seconds out of your busy day and give us a five-star review and share this message with somebody that you love and care about, that you do not have to work yourself to the point of exhaustion and overwhelm and, and getting sick. You can live a life of balance, beauty, and abundance. Tune in every week where we're going to have another inspiring speaker that's going to help you glow up to get to your next step of beautiful growth, development, and unfoldment. Thank you so much, Dr. Fujan, for being a guest on my show and for putting such wonderful goodness in the world. And everybody, until we meet again, keep your vibe high and magnetized. Hey guys, if you're struggling with online dating and just sick and tired of swiping right, if you're just not meeting the right people, or maybe you're lonely and dreading going through another holiday season single, then I have great news. I am opening my Manifest Your Soulmate eight-week class for enrollment so you can find your life partner before the holidays. Just go to the link tree link in the show notes to schedule your Manifest Love Call to learn more, and I can't wait to learn more about how I can help you find your true love for once and for all. If I can do it, I know I can help you.